Um, so one of your comments, you, you talked about, you know, if you can get a power purchase agreement for Gull after 2018, you'll go with it, but if not, there's no rush. So is Gull Island being kicked further down the road here? No, absolutely not. I think what, uh, we, you know, what we have uh, accomplished here with deciding the Muskrat Falls first is for the first time in our history, we have choices, even more choices. And uh, what I believe we have to do is keep Gull uh, very much alive. There's lots of interest in Gull, both in the U.S. and Ontario. A very important project for us. But in the meantime, uh, no need to rush. Uh, we also have a suite of opportunities with respect to other hydro, uh, some of the smaller hydro and even some of the mid-sized hydro that is available in the island that we can develop uh, one at a time. We have wind opportunities that we can scale, as they call it. Uh, basically, we don't have to do a huge amount of wind. We can do it in increments of 50 or 100. And if you look at it from that perspective, all I'm saying is that now we have options to do smaller pieces or larger pieces, depending on what the options are presented to us at any given time. But in the past, you talked about a phased approach of Muskrat Falls and Gull Island immediately after. The Gull seems a lot less imminent now, and you still have to deal with Quebec on that issue. Uh, I would say no, it's not. Uh, I, I think what I'm saying is that Gull is in exactly the same place as it was before as we strive to do that. But I'm just introducing another opportunity because we do have other uh, you know, things that we have to develop and can develop over the course of time. And I'm painting a picture to say that it's not just a gull anymore that's left. Uh, we have created a situation with uh, market access, uh, both through Quebec and into the Maritimes, where now we can sit back and start looking at developing our full suite of energy resources from the electricity side, at the same time focusing on our oil and gas resources, which, we, as, we, as I've mentioned, we just made some large discoveries of new bases that have doubled the prospectivity. And I would say that our future right now is much, much brighter uh, than it was even five years ago with respect to the options we've created. When you did the environmental assessment, though, you did pair goal with Muskrat Falls. Um, so doesn't that suggest that one would almost immediately follow the other? Are you risking having to do another environmental assessment process for Gull Island if you don't do it uh, quickly? No, uh, we'll, we'll be safe enough with that. Uh, no problem with Gull. What I am saying to the people is that uh, we, have, we have even more options. And, and you know, we never make a move uh, just because someone says, we think you should make a move. It all comes down to economics, it comes down to opportunities, and the right time. Uh, now what we have is Gull Island uh, teed up and uh, ready to go, And uh, but in the meantime, if it just comes up in some particular situation is that we think we should do something else first because we have opportunities now, we'll run the economics, we'll, do the right, we'll make the right decision, and we'll move ahead on that basis. But remember, you know, as we look out uh, our long-term plan over the next, uh, you know, three, five, ten, twenty years, these projects will all be developed. So it's not a matter of in or out, it's a matter of what's the best timing for the people in the province and from an economics perspective. And as, as I said, the prospectivity offshore is up, the electricity options are expanded, we have access both ways, and now we really have something to build on, and we are in charge of making our own choices, and we can pick our choice and timing of development uh, ourselves for the first time ever. Um, you mentioned the uh, lower electricity prices in the U.S. How would that affect export sales from the Strip Falls once it's done? Yeah, so obviously uh, it, it depends. Now, it's a, it's a commodity market, so the prices were down last year. You've seen that across, and companies across uh, North America are feeling a pinch uh, with respect to a, a current downturn in the commodity market and electricity, driven by gas primarily. Um, so uh, it, obviously the prices uh, are lower, there will be lower excess revenue but from Muskrat Falls, but still uh, the prices are nowhere near anywhere that we wouldn't be making a profit on Muskrat Falls power, that's for sure. So uh, I th it's not going to impact any of our development opportunities, but I think more importantly, uh, when you're into developments of this nature and uh, you know, large projects, obviously we have to look uh, over a 30 or 40 year time frame uh, with respect to these projects, whether they be oil based, gas based, electricity based, you name it. And uh, you have our, we have our projections up there. We know, uh, you know uh, where the projections for gas and electricity are going. Uh, we run the economics and uh, Muskrat Falls, uh, you know, excess sales uh, still make a tremendous amount of sense and add a lot of value to the problems over time. Excess sales require access. Uh, are you worried at all about movement by either individual states or even with this review that's happening in Nova Scotia with the UARB, that there might be something come up that restricts your access in terms of the potential for that sale? Uh, actually, I think the opposite, because uh, we've been, we have ongoing discussions throughout, particularly New England, uh, from a U.S. perspective. And, um, you know, we are working hard uh, with some of our U.S., uh, you know, uh, uh, alignment of interest partners. You know, they're not a direct partner to us, but we have uh, alliances down there with certain companies uh, that are looking to use our power, use some of their transmission and other, you know, different combinations to get into the U.S. So in conjunction with them, we're working uh, in New England all the time. And what we're seeing is, uh, you know, a growing uh, understanding that, uh, you know, they need to make large hydro, um, you know, uh, qualify 
for their renewable energy standards. And uh, that's what we're after. We're seeing more positive on that side than negative, which means I think the opportunity is growing because if they recognize a large hydro from Canada uh, as qualifying for their renewable energy standard, that obviously makes the case much stronger for us to get our electricity in the U.S. But don't forget, uh, you know, options are the key in this business. Ontario, obviously, uh, is very interested. Uh, they have to be. It's a great marriage with respect to our, our energy. We have what we need. Uh, you know, we need to do something. We're looking next to export. Ontario is another potential, uh, potential market for us. And our job is to make sure we continue to cultivate those markets and uh, make the right choices. Don't jump, but be ready when the time happens to make these things move ahead. What would the consequence be for us if the UARB rejected the maritime? Um, you know, I think if you stand back and take a look at what, what we've done there, we anticipated uh, a, a series of things uh, that could occur because we wanted to create the certainty we needed to move ahead with Muskrat Falls. So uh, prior to um, final sanction, we did a sanction agreement with, uh, with AMERA, and in that sanction agreement, uh, both parties agreed that the type of investment that we're talking about here uh, makes sense for us, and uh, we committed to sanction the project. We both have sanctioned the Maritime Link, meaning we're moving ahead. And, um, and frankly, in that context, that's the driver for moving ahead with, uh, with, with this project, with the loan guarantee and do, making our expenditures. And if you come back to the UARB, in that particular case, I pull myself out of that. That's a regulatory process in Nova Scotia. And I know from experience, I'm not going to inject myself in that process. That's, that's a different province, a different place. What I know is that we have uh, arrangements made uh, saying that how and when we're going to move ahead with this project. So we're going to wait and see, uh, you know, what uh, comes out of the UARB. And we'll, uh, you know, and basically at that point, we'll... We'll check our agreements and we'll see what the next step is. There's been a lot of news about the RCP freezing SNC Lavalin uh, assets in places like Montreal and Florida. Is there any concern about these problems spilling over into Newfoundland and Labrador? So I've done a, a tremendous amount of work, uh, you know, and let me just give you the basis of, of what I've checked because naturally we have to be prudent and check these things. Uh, the first thing I've had uh, ongoing uh, conversations, both uh, you know, by telephone and face to face with the uh, new president of SNC Lavalin, Mr. Uh, Robert Card. And uh, I followed, and he keeps me updated, and I follow through all of the things that are happening, and I'm comfortable that this is not uh, impacting our part of the business. But it's an ongoing dialogue that we constantly check back and forth with each other. And I think the other thing is, uh, if you come back into NALCOR, uh, the processes that we have used to select our contractors is, uh, is very detailed, very deep. Um, it involves many, many parties. It's a very clear uh, process that is best practice. And what happens in our particular case, by the time it comes up uh, you know, for an award of that project, to me, you know, I probably have, I can't name the number, but probably 15 to 18 signatures from different groups that have reviewed that for me. I bring in a set of cold eyes, as I call it, but different other folks come in to check everything, and then we approve that particular contract. So it's a competitive bid. We have all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. I'm very confident that's not impacting us. But that being said, uh, it's something we're always watching, naturally. Uh, it's the right thing to do. So you're confident everything's been above board in, in this province, whatever their problems have been elsewhere? I'm 100% confident of that. Um, and finally, do you have any comment on uh, the CNLPD approved uh, the White Rose, South White Rose extension, which Nalcor is an equity share owner of? What, what role would that mean for Nalcor? Very exciting for Nalcor. Uh, we continue to grow. We have a 5% equity in that uh, in that particular property that will add uh, our recoverable reserve base by another $2 million. And, of course, the name of the game in oil and gas is reserves replacement. And, uh, you know, it's from our perspective, exciting. Another additional reserve protection. It's indicating that the investments we've made have been prudent. The way we've structured them have been prudent. And, uh, you know, to have another step uh, in place from the oil and gas business and cover that reserves replacement, uh, we're tremendously excited about it. I wanted to ask, sorry, quickly about the energy marketing room, because uh, was a statement made about how it's sort of information, it's, it's firming up there exactly what that will be. Are you expecting to have new positions coming into play, of that being, I guess, a more expansive entity than it is right now within the next couple of years? Yes, we are. So uh, we started the... Uh, when we started off energy marketing, uh, we, we uh, took the recall and we decided to sell it ourselves and build our confidence uh, you know, in terms of exporting the market, controlling the energy ourselves and making sure that we're pulling the strings of where it's going. Uh, the way we did that, we took our, we took our time again. Uh, it, it was a new business for us, so I did an arrangement uh, with Amera actually, separate from everything else we're doing, and that arrangement was for us. We formed a small marketing team and then we used Amera and, uh, and their I guess you'd call, we call it their, their office, but basically, you know, the all the people you need, the traders and stuff you need to support us. And that idea was to do that for a period of time until we gain the expertise, uh, we know what we have to do, and we've done that now. So what you're going to see now is we're going to come off of that and start to build our own team. So yes, there will be a much expanded team. I can't tell you exactly the numbers right now, that's what we're planning. But it would be what you would see as a typical energy marketing group 
uh, in any major North American company at Marketing Energy. And the other thing, longer term, and I'm not committing to this just yet, but that's the electricity side of things. So we have recall, we're preparing for muskrat and the other developments. But remember, we have a big oil and gas business. And uh, you know, the other thing we're looking at is the next step we'll see is the potential, how much oil will we actually be producing? And we become one of the larger players uh, in, in Eastern North America from a production perspective. Uh, surely we'll look at adding that into the group at some, at some point in time. So I'm sitting back here saying that's where we should be. Uh, we have the largest energy resources available in North America. Uh, we are a relatively small population and uh, we're looking after our own needs. We have all this huge export potential, you know, that's going to happen over the next 30 or 40 years. We should be in control of how that energy is actually uh, brought into the market from, you know, from a pricing perspective and a revenue perspective. So I'm just looking ahead to say, we can't leave that to anyone else. We have to do that ourselves. Thank okay. you very much. All right, thanks, folks.